G'day guys, welcome back to Friday Knockoff, brought to you by our friends at Pepper Jack. This week on the show, one of the greatest Hawks of all time, one of my favourite players of all time, Luke Hodge. Cannot wait to catch up with this great man. Going to ask him about his move to Brisbane, glory days at the Hawks, and what his buddy Franklin and Al Clarkson up to next. Going to catch him now. Wait a second. Oh, Hodgie. Sorry, I'm late, mate. How are you? Not too bad, yourself. What's going on? Uh, not much. Mate, how's the week been? You've been a busy, busy uh, man. Yeah, four kids. So, <laughs> chasing around after them with, with sport midweek, and then um, I do get to Fridays and get to fly. I actually, I left a day earlier this week, caught up with a few of the Hawks boys mm. for a feed last night, which was, which was good. You don't get a chance to catch up now with living in a state and, and chasing around after kids. What's the main crew? What's the main Hawks crew that you try and catch up with when you're down? Um, oh, there's a mix. Virtual's up there in Brisbane now, so I see him quite regularly, but... Ruffy's normally the social mm. social butterfly who organises everyone, but there was a few last night. Joy Lewis was there as well, and then a few of the uh, few of the old staff. Which good to see some faces. Staff are almost nearly better play uh, better blokes <laughs> than the players. Actually, that's the thing I miss the most about yep. playing footy is genuinely like just getting physio treatment, catching up with staff. They're like your psychologist at the end of the day. Yeah, well, we had our uh, had our main physio Andrew Lambert there last night. So oh, you're right. I think people who stay in the, the footy industry for a long period of time. Uh, as staff, are normally the, the really good people because they put up with a lot of crap <laughs> and uh, and they're good with the banter as well. Why um why staying in Queensland? That, that, that's incredible. Like, I think I understand it now, but like, what's your reason for, for going up there? Um, did you think you did you think you'd stay in Queensland? Yeah, well, my wife told me we're staying in Queensland, and okay. I, I'm smart enough to realise <laughs> yeah. that that I don't get a say. So I think we're there. No, we're there for about <laughs> six months. I've moved up to play with the Lions for. Fag said they need a few senior guys up there, and I think we were there about six months, and it's weather was perfect. Yeah. So we had three boys at the time, and my wife said, I don't think we're going to go back. Um, and now we've got, we got the four boys now, and it's just good. They're outside 12 months of the year. There's no whinging about iPads because they're out having a kick or, or playing basketball. So it was just, as a lifestyle thing, was was really nice. Um, getting out of the footy bubble in Melbourne was also quite attractive. But in Queensland, where we are, like you've got Mooloola Bay, you've got Noosa, you've got... Byron Bay, Gold Coast, it's so much to do for, for the family out there, which is nice. It's awesome. I think COVID's taught us that now as well. You can just one flight away, always yep. connect with anyone, and it's uh, it's pretty cruisy. How yeah, airports about... are pretty busy now, though. Airports are very busy. <laughs> Not when you fly up the front like you, but when you're, when you're down the back. I actually work on the flights when I'm on them these yep. days. I'm pretty much handing out the food. When um, <laughs> you come back down, though, you're working with the footy Friday nights. Yep. So most weekends back in Melbourne. Frequent fly points is always good to get back. Uh, the frequent fly points are handy for yeah. a few upgrades every now and then. Um, it, it is good. It's um, it's always nice to get it one night away from the kids. We've got a mm. two and a half year old who's a terror, so a night away is always always nice. But I've always wanted to stay in football. Football was something that I grew up loving the game. Um, but then moving to Queensland, I almost, I almost fell back in love with it because in Melbourne, you know, it's like how oh, it's non-stop. Uh, everything you did was revolve around football up there it's a little bit a little bit more it's league so if, if it's league everyone's obsessed with league if you're AFL they're like oh but that's that's what I sort of enjoy but it made me start listening and watching more football because I started to miss it how did you find moving from playing to media and what was your thoughts of like the perceptions of being a player in the media did you think it was something you were going to go into um yeah well I'd, I'd work with with seven for a number of years prior to me finishing because there, there was always that big plan of what are you going to do post football mm. and as i said i want to stay in football but initially i'd listen to a few former teammates who sort of said they they struggled when they when they got out because they thought well, let's go on a holiday and they didn't do anything for three or four months but then a lot of the jobs have gone so i was lucky enough that i jumped back in to, to work with the lions so i had about eight weeks off at the end of my uh, career and then started going in as a coach and you still have that banter the joke around as we sort of spoke about at the start mm with the staff um, but that, that was a, a good transition phase and then COVID hit um, and I was lucky enough to continue with the with the commentary. With the commentary as well like uh, we all know what you were like as a player and I imagine giving feedback talking to players uncomfortable situations and uncomfortable conversations would have been a part of being a captain and being a successful captain. Yep. Is it similar commentating on other players now or friends in the game or is, <laughs> is, is what's harder? Um, yeah, it, it is tricky because you you got that loyalty to your mates and, and to, to your former teammates. Um, but then sometimes you, you do know that you've got to be honest. Um, so it, you do say a few things and you think, shit, is he going to like that? Is he going to enjoy that or not? But um, you, I still try and say it across as a player's point of view because 
what we have found out is it's so easy to sit back and say, oh, he should have done that or he should have hit that person. But when you're out in the ground and you know that there's that much going on, that sometimes the things that seem simple aren't. So I always try and take it from a player's point of view and what they're thinking at the time and, and try and explain it from that way. Have you had any players bite back at anything that you've done on set? Uh, yeah, Steph Martin. I, um, I, I said something about Steph in a joking matter. And that night, or no, it might have been the next day, he must have listened to it or got something sent through. So he, he, he sent a message off going, what do you mean by that? So nothing, nothing in a serious way. And, and I, I'm actually open if, if I say something and people chase me up about it. Mm. I, th I think it's good because I can explain to them what I'm thinking. And um, it's happened a few times and it's, it's sort of been able to help the player out by maybe think of this or, or other things. So... Has it changed your perception on commentating? Like looking at like looking at players now that perception you might have played against or looking at, do you look at them from a different perspective now and have more respect for guys that are that are out there? Like who's some players at the moment that you're really going, I love the way they go about it? Um, I love blokes that change their position. So looking at a Scotty Pendlebury who was happy to go back to a back flank, still playing quality football at his age, um, being able to adapt in different situations and how he leads leads Collingwood at the moment. But and I'm a big supporter of Bond, just on, on what he does. A bloke who's that tall um, can move like that and can control the game. But I am I'm, I'm amazed that the more you sit back and watch, you, you've got to appreciate it. I think sometimes when we play in the game, you don't sort of sit back and enjoy and, and mm. respect people for what they do. It's not until you finish and you sit back and go, geez, they, they, they actually go right. What they put their body through is amazing. It's interesting this year, isn't it? Like, I've been watching footy and, and just as an onlooker, I look at myself as a fan now. I'm so far away from the game and even trying to compare myself to people. But I found that we're so well-structured now and teams are so well-structured, it's nearly taking out a bit of flair from players to actually just play the natural game. Like, yeah. I don't think <coughs> this year, like... It's hard to say who is that dominant player. There's no Dusty Martin. There's no Buddy Franklin really taking the game by the horns. Yeah, you're right. Well, you can only sort of reflect on your own. Mm. And, and even back when, when we were playing at Hawthorne, when we had those successful years, it was almost like if someone's there, you've got to give them the ball, you've got to do all the team things, unless you're Cyril. Yeah. And then <laughs> that was almost the... If Cyril wants to do something... Because you know that his mindset was always team first anyway, so he'd never do something to be selfish. But it was almost like if Cyril was in a situation he wants to do a 360 or do whatever, just let him go for it. But I think you're right. The more the, more the games go on, it's... it's a team of team defence, team offence, um, do the simple things which normally work out on, on the big occasion. But I think you're right, we're, we're taken away from that part where someone will take a hanger or, or someone will kick an amazing goal because everyone's now got to kick it to the top of the goal square. Mm. Um, yeah, you're spot on. But it's the onus is on the players, I think. Like, there are still some players in the AFL and players that even I've you know, been lucky enough to play with. Someone like Lockie Whitford, for example. Yeah. And they're those players that know the rules, they know what they have to do, but they still back themselves in. And I think that's where we're lacking at the moment is. We're so structured, but there's still got to be those players who just really tear the game open. When they feel like doing it, they've got to do it. Yeah, I think with that as well, a lot of it comes from the media as well, because if mm. someone does something that's not what everyone else would do, they get jumped on. And, and they get, they, oh, they should be, they've got to be more team first, or you've got to do the, the simple things. But footy is such a, it's 24 7 now, so you've got your talk back radio, you've got TV shows non stop. And if you do a mistake where everyone, something different to what people expect you to do, you get jumped on from every point of view. So I think pe players do get a little bit shy, um, considering 10, 15 years ago they didn't really care. And it was pretty much whatever your, your teammate said was most important. 100%. You're a very humble man, so I've got to, ref I've got to watch how I ask this question. I was going to say, is there a player that reminds you of yourself playing? But I'll reframe it to say, <laughs> is there a player that you admire to what the position is that you used to play in the game at the moment? Because um, I, th I think there's one. You think there's one? Um, similar. Similar. I, it's sort of... I, I, I enjoyed playing different roles. Mm. So um, <laughs> once I found out I, I was getting beaten in a certain role, Clark would throw me forward, and then once I got beaten there, he would throw me down back. Um, I, I, I like players that are up for a challenge, up, able to adapt their game. Uh, who, who have you got in mind? Well, I, I really like the way, and I was lucky enough to play with this guy, but Sam Doherty, the way he plays half yep. back, it really imagines the way that I used to see you lead and, and talk. That, that, like, his game that he plays, what people see and what they admire is only 50% of how important he is. Yep. The way he sets people up off the ball, or the way he intercepts and talks and communicates to his teammates is, is so much better than what he actually does with the footy. 
Yeah, I'll, my first point of view would be he runs way more than what I did. <laughs> he does run very <laughs> And he far. breaks lines and he's quicker. Um, well, yeah, so Sam Doherty was my one. But, yeah, I think there's a few players out there, especially with how it goes now. And Blake Hardwick was the other one that obviously yep. has looked to sort of fill somewhat of a, a little bit of a void that, you, you know, you had... had yeah, had I've, had I've got a soft spot for, for Blake. He grew up with... Uh, my wife's cousin, I think it was. So when he got drafted to, to Hawthorne, it was actually good to have a, a year with him down back. Uh, and then he obviously took my, took my number as well. So uh, you always keep a, a keen eye on him. And whenever I see him, I'm trying to have a chat with him. He's a ripper. Good boy. If uh, if the Budwa was here having a, a pepper jack with us, which I'm sure one day all three of us will catch up and have one, yep. what would you be saying to him about what decision he's got to make coming up? <laughs> um, I, I would love to see him stay in Sydney. Like he's For what he did for the game... Uh, up in Sydney was was unreal. I was there when he kicked the thousandth goal, oh, yeah. um, and I've got photos on my phone of when he's kicked it. People started running on beforehand, but then in the space of ten seconds, it's gone from Bud having a shot to thousands of people on the ground. And then you sit back and go, it's a non-AFL state. What this bloke has been able to, <clears throat> pardon me, what this bloke has been able to do up there has been so good for the, for the game. And then you should have heard how excited people were when they heard he might be going to Brisbane. I always get messages from blokes at the local footy club. Is he going to come up? Because they just they just want to see him. He, he's one of the best that I've played uh, with and against. Um, and you just want to see him play for as long as you can. But oh, I've got a, a soft spot for him staying there and hopefully if Sydney keep developing with that younger group, he might play in a premiership there. Mm, yeah, me too. I, I love him up in Sydney. I still remember the memes people were making, you know, when they signed that 10-year deal that he wouldn't get through it and what a joke it was. But he's definitely... Um, silence the critics. What's he like as a bloke, the bud? Because I remember, we were talking off air before about not really being starstruck too often because you're in the industry. Yep. I remember when I was in Sydney and I was, uh, I was getting a South Downing sandwich actually, which I'm not sure if you've been there before, it's a great place. <laughs> And I saw Buddy, and I I did get a bit nervous. Like, it was <laughs> a bit shy. Yeah, I was a bit shy. Yeah, I don't know. He's obviously he's changed a lot now. He's he's married, two kids. Um, I heard when he was back at Hawthorne, just as before he moved up to Sydney, that he used to have to go to the same cafe, and the owner used to put him around the corner because he couldn't sit down and have a, a coffee Even or have Sydney, a feed, yeah. um, just because of how popular he is. And he is someone who he doesn't like attention. Like he's people people mistake how he is for sometimes being rude or arrogant. That, that's not him. He's someone who's he's shy, doesn't like the attention and just like to keep to himself. And I think that's why the move to Sydney did it well because, as, as you sort of said, that it's not a... Melbourne's just so hectic. Uh, and moving away to a, to a, a league or union in state was, has obviously worked really well for him. Mm. Another one of your old friends, Clark, is in the news a lot at the moment. <laughs> Red a fair bit. Not more, advice, not more advice for him. But just say if he rang you and said, Hodgie, I want you to come join my coaching panel... Are you happy in the media or do you still want to, is coaching something that you're looking to get into one day? Once again, I'd say you'd have to convince my wife to leave Queensland because mm. I don't think that's an easy so task to do. you're saying he's going to Brisbane. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, um, I've, I've always enjoyed the coaching side of things. Um, even, even when I played, I used to watch the game back from behind just to get an understanding of, of what the opposition did, what we did and what we could do better. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't say coaching's out. I, I love the media side of things because I get more family time at home. Yeah. Um, you're, you're busy on weekends, but your Monday to Friday is at home with the kids where coaching takes you back out. So until, until a two-and-a-half-year-old goes to school in about three or four years, uh, I think I'll be definitely media. But uh, I wouldn't say coaching will be always out because, yeah, as I said, it's, it's a passion and it's something I love. It's, uh, it's interesting. I think coaching's one of those ones you don't realise, maybe the general public don't realise how much work actually goes into that editing. And it's not really the... The fun side of footy, it's just that more intricate behind the goals, as you said. But yeah. if you like it, um, I'm sure there'll be clubs coming knocking. There's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of hours that go in behind the scenes for them, as you said. It's the mundane stuff, and then you've got to follow up with all the players. But yeah, the amount of tape they have to do, and I'm computer illiterate. Yeah. So trying to go through computer and set up all that kind of stuff's not yeah. not a strong point. We'll see. We'll see how we go. I'm sure you're going to get an assistant. Um, OG Pepper Jack, all about character, mate. You've got that in spades. So I've got a quick question for you. Another former teammate, Benny McAvoy retired this week. What characteristic do you admire of his the most? I've got to, I've got to say loyalty. Um, he's he's a country boy, so you know that whenever he uh, whenever he's home, he's back home with, with the family on the tractor. Um, but you know, you know, country people are loyal to their mates, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's. That's him in spades. He's he's a, an absolute ripper. Yeah, he looks like a good man. I've never met him, but he just seems like a, just a great guy. It's what you see is what you get with him. Yeah. Just a, a knock around lad. 
another one we need to pepper jack with. Hey, back to early in your career, number one pick in the draft, which is the infamous, infamous draft. It's got so many incredible plays in there. How did that sit with you back then? And what's your thoughts on the number one pick now and the pressure that comes with that? We see Jason Orr in France at the moment constantly yeah. in the media. It must be tough for a young bloke. Oh, without a doubt. You, you, you have to feel for them. Like they, from the age of 15, 16, they're getting touted in the papers and, and now everyone's trying to get the, the fantasy draft and all that, get a pick right. Um, back when I got drafted, you never. I think SEN may have just started the first mm. year I was in. There was no, there was no 24/7 TV shows about it. Um, so the pathway through was a little bit easier. Yes, it was a bit confronting having articles. And when I got drafted, one and Juddy was three, and after three years, I was injured, and he'd had a brownlow and a, and a premiership. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> reading those articles weren't great. Um, but hey, you got a feel for for the kids coming through. So much pressure at a young age, and and. We, we expect kids that get drafted at 18 to all of a sudden be professionals, be a lead at the position. Like you look at Dacos who's coming this year. What he's doing is fantastic. Um, com the composure and just the smarts is, is unreal. But we put that pressure on all these kids coming through and then as soon as they have a bad game or they're not living up to expectations, we jump on them. Um, so you do feel for them, but if they push through it, um, it it's, it's a good lifestyle to have. Definitely. I love the way the kids are coming in now. It's pros and cons in both of it because if yep. you can embrace it and you love the challenge, you love being in the line. Like Again, you look at someone like Jack Ginneman who's, who's a rookie pick, but yep. they get these opportunities and they come to clubs ready to go. They don't have a birth certificate. They rip it up and they're like, we're ready to play. Yep. Let's come, let's dominate. And even players at Brisbane are doing the exact same thing at the moment. So it's an exciting time to be a young bloke, but it's also pretty pretty scary as well. Oh, without a doubt, you, t you look at uh, the, the Ginnam, as you said, the, he's out there playing footy, having fun, but then there's always someone who's going to have a go at his, his character or what he's doing. Mm. So um, you always try and make sure that, as this goes back to the commentating side of things, that for a young fella, you always give them an extra extra go or you always try to make sure that they you can understand where they're coming from because they're just still mm. learning the game. Anyone who comes into a new job, you're going to give them time to learn and, and get experience and we expect these kids to, to be excellent straight away. Four-time premiership player. Do you have a favourite one? Um, oh, there, there's two that probably stick out for separate reasons. Obviously, 2008 Geelong. Um, broken ribs? No, no. That was, I had enough padding around the ribs. So I, Were they broken, though? Uh, we didn't get scanned. It was, we, went into, we went in on the Monday and it was like... Because I think it was... I coughed up the blood on the Friday and we didn't think much more of it. And then I think a camera or, or got it. So then um, we went and got a, assessed... It, uh, I think it was on the Monday and they said, do you want to have scans? And it was going to be, well, if I can get through training, I'm going to play either way, so what's the point? Um, and then it was a nervous few training sessions leading into it, but then, you know what they're like, they put guards on from now, and I think Stokes, he tried to hit it a few times. Um, missed, and it was, they forgot about it straight away. So, but, but the 2008 grand final was... Um, it, no one expected us to win. Yeah. So when you go into the MCG, there's 100,000 people there. Even a lot of the Hawthorne supporters are going, this Geelong team is outstanding, but it was a young bunch of guys who just will, will do anything for one another. And... and um, yeah, it, it just the, the feeling afterwards, and then spent, sending Crawf off in the right in the right manner after 305 games at our footy club um, it was a great feeling. And then the other one was probably 214, the revenge on Bud. Um, Sydney Beaters 2012, Bud left to go up there, and, and Clarko. We spoke about Clarko before, but he used the motivation of, of that of what they did to us. How'd you feel after the grand final? And then he, he said, oh, "Bud's your mate," and he's trying to rip a premiership medal off you. So it's amazing. Um, once again, Sydney in 2014 with a better team that year finished on top. Um, but they're probably two that sort of stuck out for, for different reasons. That 2014 team, do you think that was nearly the best your team has ever played together? Like it seemed it just all came together that day. No, it's funny, the 2012 year, the best football I saw Hawthorne play or felt that we played was from about round 13 to the first or second final in 2012. Yeah. Um, we finished on top of the ladder, went in there favourites in the grand final against Sydney and they, they, yeah, they topped us off. So, um, yeah, people were surprised when they, yeah, that, that was, I reckon that was the best 10 or 11 games that we'd played um, since at Hawthorne. Before I get your advice on who wins it this year, one other question about the Hawthorne-Geelong rivalry, because this is one of my most favourite rivalries in football yeah. and, I, and I don't know if it actually gets, it, I know it gets a lot of credit, but the credit it really deserves, because what's quite interesting with it, especially at that time, was you beat them in the grand final when you shouldn't have. Yep. And after that, they went on this streak of always beating you on Easter Mondays. <laughs> but Hawthorne always had this thing where you'd always win the games that actually mattered. <laughs> yeah, don't say that to Geelong supporters. They had, but you, you've, you're right. They, um, they beat us in a final in 2012, uh, 2011. I think it was the, the first final they beat us. Um, but, apart, 
but apart from that, I think, yeah, the, the grand finals we, we won, and then in 2013, the, the prelim that broke the Kennet curse. Mm. Uh, but you're right, those games, I reckon there was probably about eight or so games that were single digits, like it was under two goals, those results. Um, and it was always edgy as stuff. So it would be up by 30 points and Hawkins comes back and kicks a goal kicks it, yeah. after the siren. Jimmy Bartel kicked a point after the siren and were dry. There were so many games where you'd think it's, at one stage it surely would get over the line. But it was, it was a team that handled the pressure situations better than what we did and, and we had to learn from it. Who wins this year? Geelong are looking oh, quite God, good. No idea. It's a tough year to win. <laughs> it seriously is. Well, you, you, you probably look back and think, round 10, who's going to get close to Melbourne? Like, it was Melbourne daylight into the Lions and Fremantle. And then all of a sudden they lose three in a row and people found their, their weak spots. I think Geelong. Geelong have gone yeah. through, even though they're sitting on top of ladder, no one's talking about it. It's almost they're, they're saying, well, Geelong have played finals, they'll, lose, they'll miss out as they've done the last couple of years. But I like the way they, they, they've got a senior team. Um, they're a no-fuss team. Um, they've got blokes that are willing to play different roles, sacrificial roles for the team. Um, but yeah, so as much as the Hawthorne supporters won't like it, uh, I reckon Geelong are looking pretty good. I think Geelong will love you hearing uh, Luke Hodge <laughs> say that. The thing about Geelong that really excites me though is the, the, their best players aren't their most important really yeah. at the moment too. Like the Dangerfield Salads, they're still playing incredible roles. But we've guys like Jack Henry and like Blitzarves, Cam Guthrie. These guys are just literally taking up that next step and that's what's making them so good. Yeah, and, and look, Tommy Stewart, who, he's come in and how, how mm. good he's been from, from where he come from six, seven years ago. Um, but you're right, you look at Danger's been injured, they've been able to get through uh, and play some consistent football without their stars dominating week in, week out, which I guess that shows, I guess, the culture that they have. They've been in and around finals for the last, I think Selwood's played almost 40 finals, mm. um, which is an amazing feat, but it just shows how, how good their culture is and what they, what they can do. Your view, um, and you're very qualified going into talking about this, but going into grand finals, you spoke about Melbourne playing so well the first sort of 13 um, games of the year. You can drop away and have a little bit of a flat patch. But what's the most important thing? Is it that momentum this time of the year to start going, OK, this is where we need to build and start to get that performance? Because you can't just flick the switch. No, you're spot on. And I think everyone's looking at Melbourne going, oh, when... the game they played against Fremantle, you sat back and thought, oh, maybe, maybe they've realised what they needed to do, but then Collingwood beat them the week after. Mm. Um, it's about building momentum from here. So teams that are still trying to feel it. Um, I know the bye comes, the Bulldogs in 216 come off the bye and had four, I think they finished seventh, mm. had four good finals and that's, that's all you need. So it's making sure you're getting your, your main players back in your side, getting them fit, ready to go and just having a good old patch of, of four weeks because once that bye once a bye comes, it's, everyone starts fresh. Yeah, the next two weeks are going to be exciting to see what happens. I think it's going to really make up the final series and, uh, and see which teams are ready to go. If you weren't playing footy, do you know what you'd be doing? I'd be probably still in Colac. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was, it was one of those ones where I wasn't the best at school. Yeah. Um, probably... It's a nice I, way to say it. I probably should have yeah, given more of my attention yeah. to school, but I was, I was probably... Like, I, I put everything in, into football, and, and if it hadn't have worked out, um, yeah, I don't know, don't know what I did. I would have done. I, I've done a few few courses since, and um, done a few short courses, and got a few uh, few de degrees there. Oh, not degrees, qualifications there for, for different stuff outside of football. But I was, yeah, I, I'm always trying to push young blokes now is make sure you have something outside because if you focus solely on football and you've got nothing to fall back on, all it takes is one injury and you're, you're in all sorts. So yeah. um, I guess you learn from the things that you didn't do so well and try and pass on to others. Friday night ritual tonight, you're commentating the game. Brisbane, yep. St Kilda, should be a big one. What's your normal Friday night ritual uh, and how does it all look for yourself? Like how much preparation do you have to put into to commentating? Um, Early on in the year, you have to do a lot more because you're, you're trying to understand how teams are playing. New co Collingwood coming with a new coach, you've got a different game style. So you, you need to understand the differences, the tweaks that they've made over the pre-season. Um, as it gets to this part of the year, you sort of understand. You've watched enough football, you understand the games. The Friday night games, you, sort, you normally get the same teams two or three times in a row. Um, so, yeah, it's just about fine-tuning, understand if they're trying to tweak a few things, if they've made any changes just going into finals. But um, this is the exciting part. You understand where teams can handle the pressure, where, where they can't. So it should be a, a big month ahead ahead. Definitely will. I love, uh, co I love listening to you commentate, and that's not a lie, but my favourite part, I must say, is when you go back at Tom Brown and a few of the things. <laughs> that, must be, that must be one of your favourite times of the night. No, uh, it's... it's <laughs> The thing is, you, you, talk with, you talk with Tom and then you'll be having chats and then he'll say something and then you react just joking around because you, like, you, you seem 
two times a week, three times a week. <laughs> um, and then someone will catch on it and then it gets thrown on social media. And there's been a couple of times it has been has been pretty funny. But, no, nah, he's, he's a good fella, Tom. But um, sometimes when you have a bit of banter with people, people think you're serious. No, it's great. You can definitely tell it's banter, but it's, uh, it's very funny. I enjoy it. Mate, good luck tonight. Uh, can't wait. But we'll have to catch up, as I said, me and you and the, and the Hawks boys. Oh, round for, of golf. Uh, a couple of, well, definitely a round of golf. And we'll, uh, we'll watch it down with the pepper jack, mate. Always good to, uh, Thank to you catch might, up. Might enjoy this after the game tonight. Please do. Thank you. Thank you.